Greetings and a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending our Canes on Canes event during what is the first week of hurricane season. My name is Sharon Majumdar. Uh, I'm a professor of departments in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School. Uh, our school is located on Virginia Key and is on the left-hand side of the photo that you can see. Uh, we have uh, undergraduate, uh, professional masters, and PhD programs, and our faculty provide first-class instruction and research opportunities. We're very committed to hurricane research, uh, especially training the next generation of hurricane scientists. Our environment is quite unique, as we're located across the causeway from our close collaborators at NOAA's Hurricane Research Division, which is on the right-hand side of the photo. Now, we also have a long-standing relationship with the National Hurricane Center who are inland uh, a few miles away. Uh, we invite all of you to engage with us and you can find information about our programs on our website and we also provide frequent news updates on our social media. So now it's time to pass the torch to our next generation of hurricane scientists. And first up is Quinton Lawton. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to be able to share um, some of this um, important information with you. So thank you for joining us today. We're really um, excited to have you here. Um, as uh, Sharon mentioned, my name is Quentin Lawton. Um, some overview of what we're gonna be doing today. I'm gonna start off um, in the first, um, first part of this bit by we're gonna be giving you a presentation. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Canes on Canes and our outreach organization. And then we're going to give you a good overview of some of the hurricane research that's happening here at the University of Miami, and specifically here at the Rosenstiel School. Um, then we're going to be talking about the 2020 hurricane season outlook um, in the Atlantic. I know many of you may have seen some of the um, news articles and reports about this upcoming season, so we want to break this down so you understand it a little bit better. And then finally, we're going to be talking about hurricane preparedness this season, especially in the age of COVID-19. Um, and what you need to do to prepare starting today. And in the last 20 minutes, we're going to open this up for a question and answers um, session with the rest of you so you can ask all of us questions about what we talked about. Um, so if you have any questions at um, any time during the presentation, please make sure um, on your Zoom window there's going to be a Q&A button at the top or bottom of the page and we're going to try to answer as many of these questions as possible during the second half of the webinar. So if you can think of anything at any point in time, just go ahead and um, put that question in and we'll try to get to it by the end of the seminar. So what is Canes on Canes? Well, we're a group of Rosenstiel School graduate and undergraduate students who research hurricanes or related topics and we're really passionate um, and our goal is to educate and engage the public about the science of hurricanes and hurricane preparedness. And so this is a photo in the bottom right of some of our last year's photos of our members. Unfortunately, uh, due to COVID-19, we weren't able to take a group photo this year. So I've just added on um, the newest members, me and Jimmy on the left. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to introduce today's panel panelists. So all of us are gonna be our PhD students in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the Rosenstiel School. Um, my name, I'm on the left, my name is Quentin Lawton. Um, I became interested in hurricanes because I grew up along the Gulf Coast in Houston, Texas, and I've um, gone through quite a fair share of uh, hurricanes. And so I know very well the, um, the procedures for, of course, preparing for the storms, and I've also seen the impact on my local community. Kurt? Hi, I'm Kurt Hansen. Um, I've been interested in weather my whole life, but um, I got interested in hurricanes in particular in 2003 when Hurricane Isabel moved through my hometown uh, near DC and knocked a big tree on my house. And I was young and thought it was the most exciting thing ever. Rebecca? Um, my, uh, my name is Rebecca Evans. I am in my fourth year of my PhD at the University of Miami. And uh, I grew up in Ireland with the world's most boring weather. Um, so that's why I've decided to study hurricanes just for a bit of a change of pace. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Beth Arcodia. I got interested in extreme weather and applied math after college when I was living on Pacific Island and Typhoon Nasak actually hit the island. So I got to see the devastation and destruction firsthand. And I do more climate-based research now, but my passion for hurricane outreach and education has really remained with me. 
Hi, my name is Jimmy Yoon Ge, and I graduated from UM, and I'm in my second year at uh, Erasmus, having finished my first year. Um, I've always been interested in weather, but uh, I guess Hurricane Sandy um, really uh, flourished my interest in hurricanes, and uh, yeah, now I'm working with Dave Nolan. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for, um, for introducing themselves. So a few of us are going to be giving the presentations and the rest of us will be here at the end to answer your questions. So a little bit more about the history of Canes on Canes. We were founded in 2014 um, out of a need to really collaborate on some of the exciting outreach and hurricanes that were occurring at the Rosenstiel School. Um, if you're not familiar with the Rosenstiel School, we do um, a whole lot of outreach in all aspects of our, um, of our research here. And so at the time, there was all of this exciting hurricane outreach happening, and um, they wanted to really consolidate this into um, one group. And so at the time and, and throughout the period of Canes on Canes, we've been mentored by um, uh, Rosenstiel School hurricane researcher Brian McNulty. Um, and I really want to point out their, um, the original a group of Canes on Canes because they're really, um, they're really the foundation of what this organization has become. So in the photo below, we see Brian on the left, but then the four um, students that, uh, that pioneered this, uh, Falco, Kieran, Jason, and Matt, and all of you gone on to very exciting careers um, after the, being here at the Rosenstiel School. So we're really thankful for what they've done for helping us build this organization. Um, and so the, the Canes on Canes outreach is really um, subdivided into two big categories. So we have educational outreach. Um, so we do a lot of school visits and classroom talks, um, tabletop experiments at school events, um, after school events, for example. Um, a number of school groups will visit the Rosenstiel School, and so we often will do hurricane talks with them. Um, one of the more exciting things we do as well is um, talking to teachers and educators in a local area about communicating sort of our research and science to uh, the next generation of scientists um, and um, their students. So we really, um, we're really passionate about educational outreach. However, we also uh, like, to, um, we like to communicate with our local community. And so we uh, do a lot of events in the uh, South Florida area. So this is include um, tabletop activities at museums like the Frost Science Museum, public events, um, doing uh, preparedness talks at local community centers, um, and also engaging local civic groups and even sporting events. Uh, for example, the photo on the bottom is um, us at the two of our members at the um, US Sailing World Cup. And so just really exciting um, connections we make with our community and trying to um, get people a little bit more prepared for hurricanes. And so um, we are in an era of COVID-19 and so we haven't been able to do physical visits, but we've done a lot, including this webinar. We've done uh, quite a bit of um, virtual talks. And so we can give a, a virtual talks on any platform and it can cater to um, all age groups. So whether it's K through 12, college, adults, or teachers, um, so if you um, believe this webinar interested in learning more about hurricanes or um, bringing a talk to your area, please uh, do not hesitate to visit our website and contact us um, to get in touch. We're, uh, we look forward to giving any sort of talk in the future. Now, before we really get into um, some of the research happening here at the Rosenstiel School, just want to give you a quick overview of a reminder of what a hurricane is. Um, so a hurricane is a type of storm called a tropical cyclone that typically forms over tropical or subtropical waters. Um, this is an image of Hurricane Irma. Notice um, in the center of the hurricane, there's a, um, a low pressure center and um, a, um, there's a rapidly rotating winds around it. Um, these winds are typically very strong to be classified as a hurricane. Um, and there's also this spiral arrangement of thunderstorms around the center. And some, um, it, we call them hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin, but in other parts of the world, um, the same um, type of system is called a typhoon or a cyclone. Now, this is um, some images from inside the eye. These were taken by um, the very brave um, hurricane hunters um, that's operated both by the Air Force Reserves and also by uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and they fly into hurricanes to gather data to improve forecasts and to learn more about hurricanes. And these are pictures from inside the eye and some of these flights. Uh, notice that the eye is generally calm, but then the sloping walls of the eye wall surround the eye and it, uh, within the eye wall are the most intense winds of a storm. If you look at an animation of a um, hurricane, you notice that it's very complex. So despite there being a circulation that we expect, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, and there's a lot we don't know about hurricanes. 
And this really bridges into um, what Kurt's going to tell you about and some of the exciting research scientists are doing to learn more about these systems. Kurt? All right. Thank you, Quentin. So there's a, a lot of research on hurricanes that goes on at the Rosenstiel School, which makes sense given its location. Um, so I'm going to try to do a quick overview of a lot of the research going on, but this is by no means a comprehensive list. So first, I'm going to start out with the Dave Nolan group. Dave Nolan is a professor and the chair of the Department of the Atmospheric Science. Um, his specialty is working on hurricane simulations. And so what we have here is a simulation of the wind speeds of Hurricane Wilma, which was a major hurricane that hit South Florida in 2005. Uh, two things that we can tell from the simulation is that uh, the wind speeds immediately decrease as they move over land. Um, we can see these sharp reds transition into yellows and greens. Another interesting thing that we can see from this is that over urban areas like Miami, uh, the winds decrease even further. His student, Jimmy Gah, uh, is comparing this simulation to actual observations made in Everglades City. And we can see this comparison on the graph on the right, where the red line is the uh, simulation and the black line is the observation. And we can see they're relatively close, even though the simulation produces slightly higher wind speeds. Uh, so there's the next three people are also students of Dave's. Um, so James Hliwiak uh, is also studying hurricane landfalls. And he's also shown that wind speeds decrease immediately upon landfall, but also that the uh, location of the strongest winds change uh, as a hurricane approaches land. Uh, we can see here circled in the back, uh, or more the southeast quadrant of the hurricane, the wind speeds increase uh, considerably as the hurricane gets closer to the coast. Uh, and this is unusual because typically the strongest winds are on the right side of a hurricane. Another student of Dave's is Ryder Fox that is looking at rainfall and hurricanes. Particularly, they are looking at the case of Hurricane Florence, which was a slow moving, weak, uh, but uh, very costly and uh, very wet storm for the Carolinas doing $25 billion in damage. So what they're looking at in particular is how ice impacts uh, rainfall totals. And we typically think of hurricanes as a tropical warm weather event, but actually hurricanes form ice higher up in the atmosphere. And in fact, uh, the hurricanes create such strong updrafts and reach so high in the atmosphere that the coldest places on earth are actually at the top of a hurricane. So uh, Ryder is looking into how different ice crystals uh, might impact different rainfall rates, which hopefully can be used for predicting uh, rainfall and flooding in the future. Rebecca Evans is studying how the day-night cycle is impacting hurricanes. And so when the sun rises and the sun sets, uh, it causes pulses of motions within the hurricane that hit the top of the atmosphere and causes waves to propagate outward, like ripples in a pond. And these waves uh, transfer energy to other parts of the atmosphere, which is, of course, prediction for, is important for prediction all over the globe. And so there's a lovely animation of these uh, ripples in an actual simulation created by Rebecca. So uh, Nick Shea is a professor uh, that specializes in how the ocean impacts uh, hurricanes. In particularly, he looks at how much energy the ocean gives to the hurricane in a measure called the ocean heat content. One of his students, Josh Wadler, uh, is, uh, got to fly with the hurricane hunters into Hurricane Michael. And so Josh collected observations from the sea and also in the air uh, that will hopefully give us more information that will let us know how Hurricane Michael intensified so quickly before landfall. Another student is Shunan Wu, who is a student of Brian Soden. He is also looking at ice uh, in hurricanes. And these two figures here show the ice uh, cross sections taken by satellites uh, inside of a hurricane. Uh, and so these warmer colors indicate more ice. Um, and counterintuitively, more ice actually means more warming because as water freezes, it releases heat. So in the top figure, we see that the strengthening storms tend to have more ice towards the center, especially between five and 10 kilometers of height, whereas weakening storms don't have so much ice. And so this can be used for hopefully improving intensity forecasts in the future. Uh, Sharam Majumdar is uh, another professor here. And he works on a lot of different projects, but uh, he's done some more recent work on hurricane communication. 
And so what we have here is a picture of the National Hurricane Center cone, or maybe cone of doom. And so I'm going to give you a question. We're going to have a little quiz, and you can all play at home. What in the full picture above of this cone can one find the forecasted size of the storm or hurricane? Now, of people studied, 44% of people said, yes, you can find the uh, size of the storm. But in actuality, uh, you can't. The cone says nothing about the size of the storm. Uh, and Rebecca, in the future, will tell you uh, a bit more about what the cone actually represents. So Sharon is building a uh, perhaps a more informative graphic. Uh, and a prototype is seen here. And hopefully, this graphic will be able to communicate all sorts of different threats, such as rainfall, wind, tornadoes, and storm surge, a little bit more clearly than the cone does. Uh, a researcher that works for Sharon, as well as many other people uh, at the University of Miami, is Brian McNulty. Um, in some of his recent research on uh, community. Uh, he helped conduct a web-based survey of 4,500 people that were affected by Hurricanes Florence and Michael. And what he found is that people are willing to pay more in taxes for additional improvements in forecasts. Uh, people care most about the intensity, but are also willing to pay for improvements in track forecasts and precipitation forecasts. Uh, Quentin Launton, who introduced me, uh, is another student of Sharon's, and he is looking on how the interactions of Kelvin waves, which is a type of atmospheric wave, interact with storms to potentially develop hurricanes. And so what this loop shows is vorticity, which is a fancy term for the spinning of the winds, and how these different waves interacted to help form Hurricane Harvey. So a bit of an aside, uh, Ben Kurtman is a professor at the Rosen Steel School that works a lot with climate, um, as well as uh, quite a few of his students. Um, and even though that's not directly related to hurricanes, climate, of course, impacts storms, especially this event called El Nino. And during an El Nino, uh, there's warmer waters in the Pacific, which causes rising motion in this giant circulation that causes shear that weakens hurricanes. This figure is from uh, the Seasoned Chaos blog, which is run by Ben Kurtman students. And they just released a new post today going over how different climate events will impact this hurricane season. So some of my work also looks at El Nino, um, but also in combination with this slow moving atmospheric wave called the Madden-Julian Oscillation, or the MJO. And so we know that during a La Nina, uh, we tend to expect more hurricanes. Uh, Rebecca, if you could click. And also during MJO phases two, we expect there to be more hurricanes. However, if we look at the combined inf influence of these two phenomena, we see that during La Niña's and during MJO phase two, we actually see about average or even slightly below average hurricane activity in the Atlantic. And so because El Nino and, and uh, the MJO change so slowly, we can use these to predict hurricanes weeks into the future. Uh, Lisa Bucci works for Sharon as well as the Hurricane Research Division across the street. And she's testing new technology to measure winds in dry areas of hurricanes, like in the sea surface or where there's no rain. And so this instrument is called a LIDAR. And it's attached to the Hurricane Hunter plane. So Lisa gets to go onto a lot of different flights um, into hurricanes. And so I'm going to try to share a video that she shared with me. And this is uh, footage of her flying into Category 5 uh, Hurricane Lane. So, but she does a lot of cool stuff. Uh, and that's a picture of the inside of the eye of Hurricane Lane. At the Rosen Steel School, uh, we have the uh, large, not the largest wave tank, but the only wave tank uh, in the world that is capable of simulating a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, Andrew Smith is a student that works with Brian Howes and is looking at the bubbles that form in the waves in a hurricane. And these bubbles are important because they uh, influence how much moisture and energy the ocean is able to give a hurricane. And so uh, Andrew gave me a video of the wave tank running during a relatively weak storm. So hopefully we can play that. So that's pretty neat, especially when it uh, shows a video of a really strong storm going. Uh, this wave tank can be a lot of fun. And finally, uh, one other person that's working in the same lab is Milan Kurchich. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct. Um, 
and he is looking at um, how hurricanes impact the ocean. And so what this is showing is a simulation of Hurricane Dorian uh, moving towards the Bahamas. And we can see as Hurricane gets closer, to, as uh, Dorian gets closer to the Bahamas, and especially as it starts to slow down, waters, especially on the right side of the storm, uh, start to cool down significantly. So uh, I think any second now, we'll see a lot of blue colors coming up, indicating lots of cooling. So that's pretty neat. All right, I'm gonna pass it off to Rebecca to give, tell you a bit more about the 2020 hurricane season outlook. All right, thank you very much, Kurt. Um, I will be talking to you today about what we expect for the 2020 hurricane season and uh, where you can find useful information related to that. So a uh, bit of a spoiler, we are expecting a more active season than normal. And we already know that that is true because I don't know if you noticed, but we're already up to the letter C. Um, Cristobal made landfall in the Bay of Campeche yesterday or earlier today. And uh, us being up to the letter C already is quite exciting because it is, it is 10 weeks ahead of the normal schedule. So normally we would hit the letter C in mid-August, but we've already did it, um, hit it and it, the season only started two days ago. So we, we do are expecting a high, um, more active season this year. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the predicted number of hurricanes from various research institutions institutions. Um, these first three are governmental research institutions for Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and all of them are showing between normal and high activity. The European model, or ECMWF, and the UK Met Office are typically very high skill models, and they, they are predicting at a minimum normal activity, but the vast majority of other places, like universities and private institutions, are all predicting high activity of between 6 and 12 um, hurricanes this year. The U.S. government's official outlook is um, as follows. So they are predicting 60% um, likelihood of an above normal season. And what that means is we'll have um, 13 to 19 named storms, most likely, 6 to 10 hurricanes, and 3 to 6 major hurricanes. So just to put that into perspective, the long-term average is 12 named storms every year. So this is above average, 6 hurricanes and three major hurricanes. So uh, the numbers that we are expecting this year are above average. And what that means is that we'll have more storms and hurricanes and major hurricanes in the Atlantic. It doesn't necessarily mean we're more likely to get more landfalls here, but it does mean that we're likely, um, we're at greater risk in general just because there are more. So why, what we're expecting um, for hurricane season is based on the conditions at the moment. So I'm going to explain what we need for an active hurricane season and why we know we already have that. So um, if we're going to have an active hurricane season, we need a lot of warm water in the Atlantic Ocean. And the reason for that is that the warmth of the ocean is the fuel for a hurricane. So the warmer the ocean, the more energy for hurricanes. Um, so we need a warm ocean. We need a humid atmosphere for clouds to be able to form. And we also need favorable winds so that if a hurricane does form, it doesn't get torn apart before it has a chance to develop. And all of these three things we are expecting to happen this year, which means that we will have a more active season than normal. So just to give you some evidence for what I'm talking about, on the left, we have the temperature of the ocean at the moment um, relative to um, the normal climate. And so the um, we have the land is in gray and the yellow colors mean that the ocean is one or two degrees warmer than normal. So already the ocean is warmer than it has been in, in uh, previous years, which gives us more energy for hurricanes to form. And then on the right hand side, I'm showing you a little GIF or GIF, depending on your persuasion, of um, what El Nino is, just to explain. So Kurt mentioned El Nino earlier. What El Nino is, is whenever the water in the Pacific ocean gets a little bit warmer than normal and that means that you get a bunch of storms form in the middle of the pacific ocean and then you get this big overturning circulation and those winds from that circulation tear hurricanes apart and the reason we're expected to have a more active season this year is because el nino is not happening this year in fact we are, are had a 60 percent likelihood of el nino just not happening so it's not el nino or la nina it's just not Thing. So these two things together, the warmer temperature of the ocean and the lack of El Nino means that we are expecting a more active season this year. So I realize that um, you're, you've been given a lot of information already, 
And it can be very overwhelming because you have so many different news sources telling you a bunch of different things. So luckily for that, the Rosenstiel School has your back with the Hurricane Portal on our website. So if you go to hurricanes.rasmus.miami.edu slash hurricane portal, um, you will see all kinds of resources to, related to hurricanes. It's a big centralized list of resources that you can find. So that will direct you to official sites like the National Hurricane Center. And you can also access more advanced um, graphics like satellite images imagery, radar, the climatology of hurricanes, and if you live in the Miami area, you can access local resources there. So this is a really, really helpful website to keep in mind um, for the upcoming hurricane season. The first one I'm going to point out that is featured on the hurricane portal is the National Hurricane Center, and that should really be your go-to as regards hurricanes because it is their whole job. Um, so they have a couple of really useful graphics that I'm going to explain what they are and why you should or should not use them depending on your circumstances. So just to explain, um, this is the cone. You'll have probably seen the cone before, and I'm going to explain from the cone. Uh, I'm going to explain what the cone is, um, just so that there's no misconceptions about it. And then also they have a really useful graphic on their homepage called wind speed probabilities, and I'll explain what that is too. So you've seen the cone before, this is the cone, this is the kind of thing that you would see on the news. Um, and this is something that um, all news stations seem to latch onto, and I'm gonna explain what it is. So here we have a hypothetical hurricane spinning off the coast of Florida. Um, let's say we know where the hurricane is right now, it's where that little red hurricane symbol is. Let's say in one day time, we think the hurricane is gonna be at this red X, but we could be off by 50 miles. And then in three days time, the hurricane will be at that red X, but we could be off by 120 miles, just cause forecasts are never perfect. And then in five days time, the hurricane will probably be here, but we could be off by 240 miles. So if we draw a circle around the error and join the dots, then we have the cone. So what that means is the cone is a 66% likelihood that the center of the hurricane will fall in that region. And the errors are based on the last five years of errors. So how wrong the, the hurricane center has been on average over the last five years. So it means that the cone isn't based on that specific storm. It is based on um, just the last five errors in general. So what that means is that a huge storm and a small storm will have exactly the same cone, but a big storm could, the damages could stand far outside the cone. So just because you're outside the cone doesn't really mean a lot um, for as regards your danger. So just make sure that you understand what the cone actually is and make sure that you're always following emergency guidance when it comes to making decisions. So um, I personally recommend instead using wind speed probabilities instead of the cone. And what this tells you is the likelihood of you having tropical storm force or hurricane force winds where you live. So this is an example of Hurricane Dorian. And you can see the purple colors here um, are showing you on the left image this is. The purple colors are showing you where you're almost certainly going to get tropical storm force winds. And then on the right hand um, image, the purple colors are where you're definitely going to get hurricane force winds. And these are really helpful for making decisions related to a specific hazard. So if you're more likely to get storm surge than you are wind, you're, you'll want to prepare your home for that. So wind speed probabilities are a really, really useful graphic and they're on the Hurricane Center website and it's definitely something to consider this upcoming season. Other places that you can get graphics and forecasts if you're, if you're interested, um, on the Tropical Tidbits website, um, it's just tropicaltidbits.com, was made by Levi Cowan, who I may be on this, I'm not, maybe on this um, seminar, I'm not sure. Um, but he uh, has built this website and you can access a bunch of forecasts, including the American model and the European model that you may have heard about before on the news. Um, you can access satellite imagery and hurricane flights, which Kurt touched on earlier, which is when the US government flies a bunch of planes directly through hurricanes and takes measurements. So you can access those measurements in real time on this website, and it's a really useful, um, it's a really, really useful website to have in your back pocket. But we'd, we always recommend following official guidance for emergency decisions, and these graphics are for informational purposes only. Other places you can find fun graphics are uh, Brian McNoldy's website. Brian McNoldy is a senior research associate here at the Rosenstiel School, and he has a bunch of analysis products and satellite imagery. Um, you can see a screenshot of some satellite imagery from a few days ago on his website. And you can also access um, satellite imagery of any kind on his website. And it's a really, really great, great website. 
Um, you can also access satellite imagery for a specific storm on the SIMS website, which is a cooperative institute in the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and their website is really, really great as well. So uh, what, to summarize what I have talked to you about today, the 2020 season is expected to be more active than normal. And by that, we mean more tropical storms and more hurricanes. And that's because of a lack of El Nino conditions and higher sea surface temperatures. You, sh um, you can find information on forecasts and risks primarily from the National Hurricane Center and your local National Weather Service office. The National Hurricane Center assimilates all of the information from, from websites that I have told you about today. So all of the websites on the hurricane portal, the National Hurricane Center takes all that information and assimilates it into their forecasts. So they do that all for you. Um, but regardless of the yearly outlook, even if we were expecting a below average season, you should still prepare as though there will be a landfall because it only takes one. So even though we are expecting a more active season, um, you, should be, you should be prepared either way. And with that, I'm going to go over to Quinton for hurricane preparedness in the age of COVID-19. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for sharing with us more about the 2020 season. Um, I know it seems pretty scary when people talk about a more active season. So I just want to share with you that there are things that you can, you and your family can do to prepare for a hurricane, but also that things might be a bit different in the age of COVID-19. And we're going to tailor this a bit towards South Florida, but also know that um, any things we talk about are applicable in most places, you just have to um, um, look at your local guidance. So something that Rebecca mentioned that I really want to emphasize here is that no matter what the seasonal outlook says, it only takes one hurricane. And I want to point out this graphic from uh, Brian McNulty um, showing the hurricane force winds, um, the regions that experience these winds over um, since 2016. And something you'll notice here is that Miami has gotten very, very lucky. And part of that just really is luck. So uh, anywhere you are, along, if you're along the ghost, Gulf Coast or somewhere where hurricanes threaten um, on a pretty regular basis, you should be expecting the possibility of a hurricane every year. Um, so there are really four steps to being prepared for a hurricane. Um, the number one and most important thing really is to stay informed. And this involves knowing your area. So making sure you know local um, media outlets to follow for um, information on what's going on. Um, knowing uh, your local weather service office, where our forecasts play, um, put out. And also um, understanding um, what your county is going to do in this sort of an event. Um, and often um, counties such as Miami-Dade will have local alerts, such as the Ready Miami-Dade app. And these are ways that you can uh, stay informed, especially if you end up, tend to be busy and um, have trouble keeping up with things because of uh, work and um, et, cetera, et cetera. You also need to be building a disaster kit. So a disaster kit, we'll talk about what should be in that in a few minutes, but um, we'll, um, you should build this in advance because as we've seen with COVID-19 and also in previous hurricanes, things really fly off the shelves when it comes to um, hurricane preparedness um, supplies and things like bottled water. and um, batteries. So you want to have a lot of these supplies ready in advance before a hurricane is threatening your area. You, you should also make a plan, especially um, for evacuation. If you live in a region where you might be evacuated, you might feel like you should evacuate. And you should make a plan for, um, uh, for a hurricane approaching and what you would do. And finally, you want to make sure you're going to prepare your home in advance. And we'll go through all of these things in detail. So um, importantly, and this is the thing that um, I think everyone on this webinar should leave this webinar and do. Um, absolutely, as soon as you get off this webinar, you should check your zone, know your zone. So um, in regions across the United States, depending on where you are, um, there are mandatory evacuation procedures for a hurricane and they vary by county. So this is the storm surge planning zones that's, uh, that was uh, created by, uh, for Miami-Dade. Um, this will differ for people in Broward County. This, this will differ for people who live in Alabama along the coast or in Texas. Um, the important thing to know is that mandatory evacuation zones are mandatory and also that they're not necessarily based on uh, wind speed as much as they're based on storm surge. Um, you may have noticed this in the last few years, but hurricanes carry a lot of additional risk beyond just the high wind speeds, but also um, the effects of storm surge and also the effects of rainfall, for example, with Harvey. So um, you really wanna keep up to date with your evacuation zones and also check your local county for um, their guidance on evacuation and hurricane preparedness because it will differ by county. But one thing you should do today is to find your local resources, go to your local county's website, uh, look for hurricane preparedness tips and also procedures so you know um, where you live in relation 
to these zones and also what your plan might uh, be. So um, if you are planning an evacuation um, due to a hurricane, you've either been mandatory, uh, evacuated on mandatory evacuation, or you live in an area where you don't feel safe staying at home, you should understand that during COVID-19, things are gonna be a lot different. It will be a lot more complicated, and this means it's gonna take a lot more planning. Um, so the number one thing you should know about, um, about preparing, uh, Rebecca, do you mind advancing? So, um, there are some uh, important aspects that you should consider. First of all, um, county shelters. So many, um, most counties in the event of hurricane will set up emergency shelters. Um, and you should know this is an option to you if you have nowhere else to evacuate to. But you should also uh, understand that we are in the era of COVID-19. You should be a bit more prepared if this is um, your option. And if you have other options, they might be, uh, they might be better options for you just because you wanna protect yourself from COVID-19 and um, you know, plan accordingly. Um, if you're evacuating out of the state, you need to know, at, or in even another region, what are the conditions of COVID-19 in the area you're evacuating to? Are there local ordinances? Are there local laws that you have to be aware of? And you have to update this consistently so you know what your plan is. Um, and finally, um, we'll talk about this with disaster kits, but you need to make sure that you are adding um, uh, protection in terms of mask and disinfectant, maybe hand sanitizer to your disaster kits, because you're for sure um, going to have to, um, you're gonna have to keep this in mind um, due to COVID-19, and this will also tend to fly off the shelf uh, in, in a hurricane. And so the most important thing is that you have to make decisions earlier and you have to continuously update them. Um, due to COVID-19, which is always going to be the case um, where you're going to have to make these early decisions, but you're going to have to make even earlier decisions because of COVID-19. It's not to scare you, but it's just to be aware of the current situation. So um, moving on to, um, to some of our detailed uh, information on uh, to preparedness. Um, so one of the things you should start doing um, this week, um, for example, is making a disaster kit. So I know you're probably not going to remember all of these items on uh, top of your memory, that's okay. Um, uh, the US government, the CDC, uh, FEMA, ready.gov, there are a lot of resources we'll share with you later that are going to give you some guidance on what should be in a disaster kit. But some general items for, um, you should have a lot of uh, a gallon of water per person per day, uh, enough for a week and also non-perishables. Remember that during a hurricane, the first thing you often lose is electricity and you may also lose power, um, lose water. So that means that anything in your fridge probably won't be usable after the first day. So you have to keep that in mind. If you have prescription medications, make sure you're always up to date in refills. And if it's possible, I know it's not always possible, but if it's possible, get um, additional refills uh, in advance of a storm. Um, things like hygiene items, first aid kits, making sure you have a way to charge your mobile devices without electricity or a wall outlet, this could be hard. Having a flashlight, and I think most importantly, having a way to get information if you have no electricity. This is often in the form of a battery powered radio with extra batteries. You also should have extra documentation such as um, important um, phone numbers, um, your driver's license, social security card, things like this. Make sure you know where it is and you have it on you. And um, also you should be this year um, considering adding things like hand sanitizer and some masks to your disaster kit so that you um, aren't rushing to the store to get these if a hurricane is approaching. Now, um, Rebecca, um, if you are uh, planning to um, ride out the storm um, in your home, uh, you're not in a mandatory evacuation zone, you should um, do a few things to repair it. So um, if you have things outside that could fly, uh, fly around during high winds, you should move this stuff inside. Um, if you have hurricane shutters or plywood and it's, uh, you're advised to do so by local authorities, you should put them up. Um, something you may not um, be familiar with, but something I myself have actually dealt with when I was a kid during Hurricane Ike, is that losing water pressure or losing the ability to uh, have drinking water can be uh, very hard in the aftermath of a hurricane. One tip you can do is to fill up a bathtub with water as the hurricane's approaching so that you have uh, water to do things like flush the toilet because sometimes you don't think about these minor things when the hurricane is approaching. Um, if you are told to evacuate, you need to evacuate. So if it's a mandatory evacuation zone, they're doing that for a reason, you should leave. And with everything, this is gonna vary by your county and your, lo uh, your, your local jurisdiction. So please check with local emergency management um, on their websites and through um, uh, press releases uh, in the time of the hurricane. 
Now, if you are riding out the storm again, um, if you're staying in your home, um, please stay indoors during the Passover of the eye. Um, so um, the eye may be a time of relative calm during the storm, but um, the eye wall is the most intense part of the storm. And if you're in the eye, you're eventually going to go through the eye wall again. So you need to stay indoors, even if it's calming down outside, because you don't know when that's going to happen. Um, stay away from windows, um, you know, be, be wary for home starts to flood, be prepared for that. Um, and you, again, we don't wish, uh, we don't, um, you know, I hope this is never a situation that anyone here is in, but if your home is starting to fall apart or, you know, you're worried about that, um, one thing you can do is get under a mattress to protect yourself. Again, uh, we, usually this is not the case, but you have to be aware um, that this could be a possibility and be prepared for that. Now, I think one of the more dangerous aspects of hurricanes is not just during the storm, but right after. Um, unless you're told to leave by local authorities or it is unsafe for you to stay in a certain area, you must stay inside. Um, this is because um, there are a lot of hazards that exist after a hurricane. Um, down power lines, for example, live and escaped animals. Um, be wary of water. Water can uh, there be waterborne illnesses and um, carried by, by water and it can be hazardous to your health. Um, and also, um, after the storm, make sure that you're taking pictures of the damage um, right after you encounter it so that you have it for your insurance company if you're submitting a claim. And so a lot of this seems pretty scary, but um, we, but again, the thing with preparedness is to be prepared for the worst. But um, so um, the thing you can do today is if, as soon as you live this webinar, please check your zone, please know um, exactly where you live and your local procedures for evacuations and preparedness. And also in the next few days, make sure you have conversations with your friends and family and also develop multiple uh, backup plans to evacuations. So for example, a lot of people go and stay with family members um, when they evacuate, but you might wanna have those conversations now because with COVID-19, certain high-risk individuals may not want um, you staying in their home. And it's good to have that conversation in advance and not uh, a few days before hurricanes going to uh, make landfall. So please make sure that you're having conversations early and that you're talking with people and that you're building a disaster kit. Um, here's some additional resources, FEMA, the CDC, ready.gov, all have important information. There's some specific information by the CDC and FEMA on COVID-19 in the age of hurricanes um, in the in hurricane season, so check that out. Also some phone numbers. Um, again, you can find these all online, but um, a quick Google search can help you find these. Um, if you are a University of Miami employee, um, um, there are specific, uh, specific alerts that go out to you um, by the University of Miami. Um, you can go to prepare.miami.edu to learn more about some of the things that the, the Office of Emergency Management um, at UM um, can provide. Um, so if you're faculty, staff, or students, please, um, please look for some of these social media um, outlets uh, to get information um, and to stay informed in hurricane season. And so in summary, um, we went through a lot today, but hurricanes are very complicated, but luckily um, scientists here at the Rosenstiel School are committed to um, pioneering research on the topic. And also I'm um, sharing this research with the public so you can learn more. Um, the 2020 hurricane season in the Atlantic is expected to be more active than normal. However, um, even if it wasn't, you should start preparing now because it only takes one hurricane um, to, um, to cause devastation. And this year, you'll have to be more prepared than ever because of COVID-19 um, and, and start preparing earlier and be ready for um, changes. Um, so being adaptable and flexible in your preparation. So make a plan, build your disaster kit, and please um, continue to stay informed. And so um, now we're going to turn it over to the question and answer section. Um, so um, many of you have submitted a lot of questions, and we're going to try to take a stab at answering them. Um, I just want to point out a few things. For one, um, even though three of our Canes on Canes um, panelists spoke, we actually have Mary Beth and Jimmy here as well to answer your questions. Um, if you have a specific question for a member of our team, um, please say so in your um, question just so that we can try to direct it to the right person. Um, and also uh, remember that if you want any more information on the outreach that we're doing, um, visit the link below or just contact someone in the Rosenstiel School and they'll get you connected. Um, and so at this point in time, I'd like to pass it over to Mary Beth, who's going to be helping um, lead us on some of these question and answers. 
Hi, thank you. Okay, so um, yes, please submit your questions in the Q&A. And uh, we have a lot of similar questions coming in. So uh, we're gonna try and answer as many as we can, but if we don't get to all of them, um, please know that you can email the um, email address that we've provided. So we're gonna start off, we have a question about the different um, hurricane models. And so uh, what's the biggest difference between the various hurricane models, uh, particularly the American versus the European models, and which do you believe is the most accurate? So I'm gonna pass that question over to Jimmy. Yeah, so since I directly uh, work with hurricane models, I really, I really like this question. So many, many models are used to predict and simulate hurricanes. Um, there's statistical models that use the history of previous hurricanes, and there are global models and regional models. So I'll talk about um, what some of those are. Um, the models that are perhaps most talked about are the state-of-the-art American GFS model, the Global Forecasting System, and the ECMWF, or Euro model, um, made by a consortium of European countries. And so the GFS and the EC model are global models. So they simulate weather all over the globe. Um, that means you can like find weather over New Zealand if you wanted to. Um, in order to uh, run uh, these simulations and calculate all these differential equations that predict the weather all over the globe, they have wider grid resolutions and so what they're really good at is predicting the steering features. So they're very good at predicting the track of the storm. And that's why they're used so commonly. We also have um, regional or in other words, mesoscale hurricane models. Um, these models are built basically to simulate um, hurricanes especially. So these have grids that follow that generally follow a hurricane with smaller grid resolution or like smaller spacing between grid points that allow representation of physical processes that control the overall intensity and structure of the hurricane. So while a hurricane's track might be greatly influenced mostly by the large scale steering flow, the intensity is much harder to predict because it involves interactions with the larger environment, interactions of the storm with the larger environment, and also like really small scale processes like um, heat transfer by the turbulence going inside of a hurricane. So none of these models are perfect. Um, they're different in how they uh, feed observations into the model and also calculate these physical processes that take place on scales smaller than the grid points. And this is why we have human forecasters um, who take the objective computer outputs and are experienced with um, each, each of the model's biases per se. And they're also generally familiar with how hurricanes behave. And so they can make the best informed forecast, which is why we use the NHC instead of like following the GFS or the EC model completely. Um, another word of mention should be the spaghetti models, those plots that you might see being um, passed around during a hurricane. Um, a lot of care should be taken with these because um, of the biases that are not really um, made explicit in these plots. So like as an extreme example, um, a spaghetti plot might have a straight line as a track, which is basically what the storm, um, it's just extrapolating the storm's current speed and direction, which obviously is not, um, which does not happen. So um, I hope that helped you. I hope that answered your question um, about hurricane models. Great. Our next question is going to be for Rebecca Evans. And so um, 
there's uh, different ways out there about reducing the power of hurricanes through various techniques, such as slightly cooling the ocean below the storm. So can you say anything about progress on these sorts of ulterior uh, alternative techniques to managing hurricanes? That is a fun and uh, also scary question. Um, so we have been asked a bunch of times about various ways that you can control hurricanes. Um, can you all hear me okay? I feel like I'm lagging. Okay, um, so uh, something that has been suggested before is um, dumping a bunch of ice into the ocean and you would have to uh, dump ice around the size of several United States um, to put into the ocean to cool the ocean surface down enough so that hurricanes weren't stronger. Um, that is just something that's not particularly feasible um, just because where are you going to get all that ice and stuff. There's also um, other things that you can consider like um, should we nuke a hurricane, which is something that came up last season that the president suggested. Um, that's not really a particularly good idea, um, just because if you would have to get it exactly right, you would have to explode a um, 10, meg uh, 10 megaton bomb every 20 minutes on average in order to um, tear the hurricane apart, just because they have so much energy. And then if it didn't work, then you have a radioactive hurricane. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that are um, possible options, it's just that they're very hard to do. So there was a, an experiment by the United States government in the 60s called Operation Storm Fury, um, in which they dropped silver iodide crystals from planes into hurricanes with the goal of weakening them. And the, um, the data from that was very inconclusive as to whether or not that actually worked. So uh, while it is an interesting idea for whether you can control hurricanes, um, Something to consider is even if we could do it, should we? Because hurricanes are very important for transpa uh, transform uh, sorry, transporting heat from the equator to the poles. Um, and if you reduce that heat transfer, then you can also play with the entire global climate. So by, by modifying hurricanes, you would also have downstream impacts that we may not have considered. So to answer your question, essentially, hurricanes would be extremely difficult to control. We simply don't have the resources to do it. And there would be a whole bunch of downstream impacts, whether that be on the global climate or radioactive fallout, or just that it's extremely costly and difficult to do. So our better way to deal with this is just better preparedness for coastal communities. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've gotten a few questions about how we know if an El Nino or La Nina is going to happen because it plays such a big role in hurricane forecasts. So I can actually address this and there's a few factors that we look at. An El Nino or La Nina is defined by the temperature of the ocean surface in the um, equatorial Pacific. However, there's other factors that determine if an El Nino or La Nina will form. And a big one of these, this is the ocean water below the surface. And so we can monitor that to determine if the water is looking to be cooler or warmer than normal. We also look at the wind conditions that can drive these. And so we run, um, a ton of these climate models and take the averages of these. And so that's why we usually get a spread. And um, based on the average of these, that's how we determine if we uh, believe in El Nino neutral or La Nina conditions will develop. So our next question is um, going to be for Kurt. So the first one is, do hurricane hunters fly um, during a global pandemic? That's a good question. This question actually came from my mom and I'm sure she's very nervous that I might get onto a plane that will fly into a hurricane. Um, fortunately for her, uh, there's no uh, research missions uh, this year, but um, unfortunately that means that that's a lot of data that we're going to be missing out. So, um, of course, uh, there are still flights by the Air Force that are going to uh, fly into the storms to get uh, really crucial information, and the uh, NOAA planes will also be tasked to fly into these storms. Great. And then a uh, follow up on that is um, the steering of tropical storms. So is there a specific pressure that you follow on a pressure map to get an idea of where a storm will go? So unfortunately, predicting hurricanes isn't quite that simple. Um, the steering impacts storms on pretty much all levels. Um, one thing is that stronger hurricanes are impacted uh, by winds at higher levels. 
um, which complicates the forecast. And of course, the steering patterns change too. So um, in short, it's complicated and you kind of have to look at all of the levels. True, it's always complicated. That's a good scientific answer. Um, we've had a lot of questions about if you would be able to access this PowerPoint again or all of the resources. Quinton put a link in the chat so you can access it there. This, um, this presentation will be up on the YouTube channel and will be emailed to all registrants afterward. So um, in our last few minutes, I also want to acknowledge that our UN preparedness um, lead, John Gula, is also on this call. And so, uh, John, I would like to give you the mic so you can answer a few of the preparedness questions, especially in light of COVID-19. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mary Beth. And uh, great job uh, to everybody, especially with uh, Quinton, with doing the preparedness stuff. Um, we deal with uh, this uh, year in, year out, whether it's hurricane season or not. This is a big part of our job in the Office of Emergency Management. So um, thank you for highlighting those items. So I saw that there was a few questions uh, that were coming up with related to specifically uh, the COVID-19 impact on some of preparations and things that are happening. Um, one thing I will uh, start with is that there is planning going on already, uh, not only at a UM community level for us as a community, but even at a local level for county, city, and state planning for how to think about our existing planning for protection of our uh, populations uh, during a hurricane while under a, a pandemic world. Um, and those are things that are continuing to be worked out right now in terms of uh, how to think about this. I will say that uh, I've been a part of some calls where we have discussed specifics such as how much square feet is necessary uh, to keep uh, people within uh, certain realms and, and keep that uh, physical distancing uh, measure in place while also keeping those people protected. So the, the short answer there is yes, there is a lot of stuff going on already in terms of how to plan for this uh, in evacuation shelters if necessary. Now, um, that said, I will also add uh, that uh, the idea this year of preparing early, as Quentin mentioned, is really probably the most important thing. And by preparing early, we're not only talking about the, the kits, we're also talking about um, things like having different planning possibilities. So uh, if you have their friends that are nearby that live more inland and are not in evacuation zones, that is a really good start to thinking about, okay, where can I go if I need to, which then uh, you don't have to worry about necessarily evacuation shelters run by government or the county. Um, I also wanted to just maybe end with uh, the idea that uh, we are also looking at a lot of different ideas for how we can give people advance time to prepare and to plan as a university. Um, our plans always call for a minimum of 72 hours notice with hurricanes and with getting out information uh, with regards to evacuation. Somebody asked uh, the uh, evacuation plans uh, for the Coral Gables campus, which is uh, three category three or higher for evacuation. Um, we're, we're still on that same, we're not changing that in any way. However, we do have enough flexibility in our plans to adjust that as necessary. Uh, if, if needed to do and, and look at different ways. And we're trying as best we can to continue to give as much notice as possible uh, under those type of scenarios. So I think I got to every question there. If there was ones that uh, I didn't, please uh, feel free to, to ask in and I'll happy to answer those. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you. Okay, so um, to close out, I would like to introduce Dean Abasar. He's the Dean of the Rosenstiel School and he has some closing remarks for us. And uh, thanks uh, Marie Beth and thanks the entire team for putting this uh, presentation together. It was in fact uh, amazing and as the, the leader of the school right now, I'm extremely proud of uh, all of you for doing such a wonderful job. I mean, it has been absolutely amazing and, and great. We as a faculty have to learn from you guys, okay, how to uh, organize an event like that. So uh, thank you again uh, for taking the time and uh, putting the effort to organize that and lead this entire activity. 
And uh, thanks everybody for listening. I hope that uh, like me, you have gained a lot by uh, listening to the different presentations and uh, stay healthy away from the coronavirus. And let's hope that uh, in spite of the predictions that we get for these years, uh, even if there are more hurricanes, hopefully none of them is going to make it to Miami. So um, remember that's in fact the most important message, I think, okay, from where we stand, uh, alone from the research and the interest. Um, a season that is uh, predicted to be a very low intensity, it's enough to have one hurricane to devastate the region. Uh, by the same token, I hope that a season that predicts a lot of hurricanes will avoid to come to Miami. So let's, uh, let's hope for the best. And again, thanks very much.